Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. We will get started. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining today. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Vanessa. I'm a specialist here at Statistic Solutions. And today I'll be presenting on uh, confidently presenting your quantitative results chapter. So before we get started, you'll notice in the chat there are a few links. 
um, and some information uh, that may be helpful to you. Here at Statistic Solutions, we do provide one-on-one -on -one dissertation editing and consulting services. Um, we help students with all of the different chapters in the dissertation from the very early stages of topic development through um, the final defense. So if you are someone who thinks that you could benefit from some of that help, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We do offer a free 30 minute consultation. So today to get started, uh, we're going to be talking about the results chapter. So just an overview of what components you should be expecting to include in this chapter. It will typically have the introduction, um, data collection and preparation, demographics and descriptive statistics, assumptions testing, analysis of the research questions and hypotheses, and then a summary. Um, this, this chapter, uh, we always recommend that when you start writing to review any template or um, checklist that your school might offer, this list is pretty comprehensive here on what you should include, but just to be safe, I always recommend just check in with your school to make sure there aren't any specific components or a specific um, structure that they're looking for. That way you're including all the information that's needed for this chapter. So the purpose of this chapter here is really to um, just present the data and the analysis that you did for your study. This chapter is not, um, it's not dedicated to your interpretation of the results, but instead it's really just to present uh, those facts and figures, the numbers that you got in a very um, objective way. Typically, you're going to present your findings by research question or by hypothesis. Um, and you want to make sure that for each research question that you've laid out in the earlier chapters, you have a clear um, answer to that research question, and you're clearly stating whether or not your hypothesis was rejected or uh, whether or not you failed to reject the hypothesis. Again, you want to save any interpretation about what these results mean or how these results affect the um, sample or the population that you studied. You want to save those things until the discussion, so reserve all you know, thoughts around these results for the next chapter. And as always, make sure that you are following the guidelines of your school as you're putting this chapter together. So when you start your results chapter, you can begin with a brief restatement of the purpose of your study. Typically, this can be done verbatim. So you want to make sure that as you're moving through the chapters of your dissertation, the purpose of your study is very clear and concise. Um, so you can take the, the purpose statement that you used earlier and just kind of restate it here. Don't change the words around too much because each of the words will really have implications for what, what the purpose of the study is. So try to make sure that you're being consistent throughout. Same thing with the research questions. Here you'll want to remind the reader what your research questions are um, and any hypotheses that you are testing for this study. And then kind of think of this as looking backwards and looking forward. So you're reorienting them to everything you've already said, the what for this study, the research questions, and now you're going to give them a preview of what is going to be coming up in the chapter. So to do that, you might... Um, just explain some of the subheadings that you're going to be writing about. So you will talk about data collection procedures, did study, and here you also want to note if you deviated at all from your original proposal. So um, typically chapters one through three are going to be your proposal chapters. That's where you are putting out the plan for how you intend on collecting your data and carrying out the research. Uh, but it's not unlikely that things change from those, the data and analyze your results. So here you just wanna report back if there were any changes. 
Now, some schools will want you to go back to chapter three and change it to reflect the changes there, whereas some schools will have you leave your chapter three, so your methods chapter, and then just explain where you deviated from your plan in chapter four. Um, so again, just checking in with your school to make sure you know what they expect. Um, but but here is an area where you may want to report those deviations. So, for example, if you said that you were going to be doing in person um, paper and pen surveys to collect data, and then maybe due to um, the pandemic or maybe other reasons, you switch to like an online survey, you just want to make sure that you're noting that here so that as your readers interpreting your results, they understand the setting um, of your study. Next, you'll want to talk about your response rate and any um, and your attrition. So, thinking about how many total responses did you receive on your instruments. So, if you distributed a survey, how many people responded to that survey? And then, with the sample that you've collected, were there any people that you had to remove from the sample? Um, and what were the reasons that you did that? So, typically, your study will have some sort of inclusion or exclusion criteria. And maybe you put an online survey out there and received responses. You're looking through the responses, you realize that maybe 25 of them are from people who did not meet the inclusion criteria for your study. In that case, you will report um, that you included a certain sample and then give the final sample size for your study. If you were not able to receive the sample size that um, that you needed to. So if you conducted a power analysis early on and it recommended a particular sample size, but you weren't able to do that, you may need to um, explain that a little bit here as well through a post hoc power analysis um, to talk about that sample size and and what the implications of that are. Next, you'll want to talk about any uh, data preparation or data cleaning that you did in order to prepare your data for analysis. So when you think of data cleaning, I want you to think of everything from inputting the data into some type of um, computer or software, especially if you did a paper and pen survey, how did you move that data from worksheets to Excel or whatever it is that you used? Um, and then you're going to talk about the missing data and any outliers. So um, how did you handle situations where participants skipped multiple questions? Uh, maybe you set up some rules for this. So for example, if participants miss 50% of the questions, maybe you exclude that participant, or maybe you take some sort of um, composite score or mean score um, to replace those missing values. So here you really just wanna think through what the process is going to be for you to prepare this data set to be analyzed Specifically, um, if you're missing data related to the variables that you um, have outlined in your research questions, you know, what are you going to do uh, to make up for that? How are you going to ensure that you're able to answer your research questions? This is a very um, individualized process, but you'll just want to outline exactly what you did to get it prepared for those um, main So, sample you may be using that requires you a sum score of responses. Um, so, to do that, you may be creating a separate variable for sum. So, something like that, you would also want to explain um, what it is. And the reason for this is. As when you are presenting your results, you want to make sure that the reader understands how each variable is operationalized. Um, so in a case like that, where you um, you know, you just kind of take steps to explain exactly how you got the number that you did, how you were analyzing that particular number. So we'll do a few examples of what this looks like. Um, you all receive a copy of these slides. You have these examples to refer to as you begin writing and begin working on your paper. Um, so in this example, you see that this person had an initial total of 485 survey responses. And then they are explaining the, uh, the exclusion of specific responses. So for this survey, they're excluding anyone who um, 
didn't complete 50% or more of the questions pertaining to the variables. So we are excluding those people and we're ending up with a final sample of 396 participants. So this is one way that you might talk about uh, these sample size pieces that we were just talking about on the previous slide. Um, and then again, you'll also want to talk about the particular software that you're using. So mostly just identifying it and identifying the type of analysis that you're doing. So in this case, this person's doing a regression. Here's another example. This one's a little bit more detailed. Here, um, they're actually specifying the specific exclusion criteria that each of these people were excluded for. So here, there were 163 participants who accessed the survey. Three of these participants didn't, um, didn't provide their informed consent, so they were excluded. Another 59 participants left 10% or more of the survey questions unanswered, so they were also excluded. And then three more didn't have um, active work experience as a nurse. So these people just didn't meet the inclusion criteria to participate in this study. And so we explain all of that and then provide the total final sample. So here the final sample was 98. They're also talking a little bit about their missing responses. So here it looks like there were no missing responses in this remaining 98. So there was no additional um, manipulation that needed to be done to account for any missing data. So again, just another example of how you might go about um, describing that exclusion of participants. Now, this case is where you would talk about a post hoc power analysis if you were not able to achieve the sample size that you intended. So this person is saying that they conducted the post hoc power analysis and they're giving the relevant um, test statistics. So here they're telling us that the power was 0.76 um, and they're also explaining that the three predictors and the sample size the power of that here was 0.94. So again, just another example of how you might present this information. So once you've given um, a detailed description of your sample, next you're going to talk about any descriptive statistics that you're going to be looking at for demographic variables and variables of interest. So typically the demographic variables will be pretty standard. You might be looking at things like gender, age, um, maybe race, ethnicity, um, so these more basic demographics. And then your variables of interest, those are gonna be the variables that are laid out in your research questions. So for example, if you have a research question that says um, you wanna explore the differences in postpartum depression among women who have maternity leave and women who don't. In that research question, we've got three variables or two variables. We have postpartum depression, and then we have this binary variable of maternity leave. So for that research question, you might um, run some descriptives on presence of postpartum depression and then also presence of maternity leave. So here is where uh, you would report those things. If you um, have categorical variables, so in my example, both of the variables are categorical, postpartum depression, maybe yes or no, and then maternity leave, yes or no, then you'd be reporting frequencies and percentages. So what percentage of people said yes, what percentage of people said no. Um, you would want to report N, so the, same, the size of the people that said no or yes, and then the percent of to, of the total sample of what those people make up. Um, and then if you have continuous variables, so for example, age, uh, maybe if you're looking at weight, you would be reporting the mean and the standard deviation. What was the average age of the sample and what was the standard deviation um, from the mean between the participants? The um, so in the 
post crash. I found a script of statistics and how prevalent from depression is in my sample. And I go to like the CDC website, or I might look in previous literature and get an idea of what postpartum depression is in the overall population. Comparison, see, you know, is my group experiencing postpartum depression at a similar rate? Are they experiencing at a lower rate? And just provide a little bit of context what these variables of interest look like. Uh, yeah. uh, quantity um, goals to make sure that the simple population uh, so that these can really can rely on really groups and you draw inferences from. So this is again the text for the reader going your result to understand um you know is this Sorry about that. It looks like I was disconnected. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, okay. Um, let's see, well, how much did we get through this slide? I'm not sure where I dropped off. Maybe we'll take it from the top. Um, Sierra, did I drop off before this slide or during? During the slide, okay. Okay, so, um, I think what I was talking about when I got disconnected was this idea of comparing the demographic characteristics of your sample to the greater population. So here you're trying to give the reader an idea of how generalizable your results are um, and how applicable your results are going to be to the greater population. So for example, if you are reporting the demographic characteristics of race, and your sample is turning out to be, you know, maybe all people of the same race, whereas your study is really looking across demographic groups, that may be an indicator to the reader that these results are not necessarily going to be uh, representative of the population. So that's the purpose of this step here. You also will want to present um, the reliability coefficients of the measures that you're using. So typically, if you're using some type of validated instrument, um, you can find these um, reliability coefficients in the foundational literature for those instruments. Um, and the purpose of that is to ensure that the measurements that you're using are true, um, true measurements of the variables that you're looking at. So we just want to make sure that you are using things that are going to give you a really good feel for these particular variables that you're studying. So for example, the Beck depression inventory, that's a validated scale. Um, there are a number of validated scales for self-efficacy, leadership, each of these things. So you just want to kind of present here, give that, uh, that preview so that they know that you're studying um, your topics with a validated or reliable instrument. Okay, so another example. Here's an example of how you might present your demographic characteristics. So typically, um, you will want to do this in a table format just for uh, ease of readability. And you'll also want to provide um, a brief narrative description before the table to give a summary of what the table says. So in this case, they are again telling us um, what the sample size was. So 
Here we've got our sample and then we are giving the breakdown of the gender, age, and um, how many were missing. So in this case, you'll notice in the narrative, they're not saying, you know, all of the different uh, levels of the variables here. They're just saying the majority of participants were men and then kind of the, the, um, the most observed age range. That's okay to do in the narrative because again, you're gonna have it all laid out in the table. So just use that narrative to really give the high points of your sample. And here you'll notice that these are both categorical variables. So we've got gender, we have two levels of gender, male and female, and then we have age. And we've got four levels of age um, looking at these different categories. And since these are categorical variables, we're gonna be reporting frequency and percent. Now, I know earlier I said that age can be a continuous variable, and it can, but just want to note that in this case, it's categorical because rather than reporting um, specific numbers that can be plotted on the number line, we're looking at these age groups, so that's why it's categorical. Here is another example. Now, in this case, we are looking at continuous variables, so we're looking at age, time working as a mental health nurse in years, and then the nurse to patient ratio. And here we're reporting the mean and standard deviation, as I mentioned on the first slide, and we're also reporting the minimum and the maximum, and we have our total sample size here. So this is just another example of how you would present this information if you have continuous variables. Now, in this example, we are presenting the reliability coefficients for the subscales that are used to collect the data. So in this case, um, they are looking at a number of different subscales. So we've got some positive attributes, self-kindness, common humanity, and it kind of goes on from there. And to present this information, the writer is presenting how many items are in each subscale, so how many questions are in it and then um, the Cronbach's alpha coefficient. And again, this information may already be available in previous literature, but you also may uh, be able to calculate it yourself um, in the software that you're using. So now that you've explained, you know, you've reminded the reader what your study's about, who you're studying, you're talking about the instruments that you're using and how many people have been included in the study. The next step is going to talk about the actual analysis that you're doing. Before you get into the main outcome analysis, you'll need to talk about any assumptions testing that you had to do to get to that point. Um, so a number of tests may have a specific assumption that needs to be met in order to do that test. So for example, if you're doing a t-test, um, some assumptions that need to be met are homogeneity of variance um, and normality. And these are, these are things that you can find online if you're struggling with, you know, what are the assumptions of the test that I want to use, or maybe even what test should I use? We do have a number of resources on our website um, that I can point you to at the end if you have questions that can help you kind of figure out based on the variables that you have, uh, what what test makes the most sense. But once you've identified what test makes the most sense, then from there you'll identify the assumptions that you need to do. Um, and that's kind of where you come in here where you're going to be talking about um, how you're gonna test those assumptions. So here you'll say how the assumption was tested. What was the result of the test? Was it met? Was the assumption met or not? And then what are you gonna do if it's not met? So for example, if the assumption that you're testing is normality, here you're going to explain how you're going to be testing it. So to test normality, you have a few options. For example, you might look at the skewness and kurtosis of the data for the specific variable. You might look at a histogram to see if the data is normal. Um, you could maybe run a Shapiro-Wilkes test. So you have a few options on how you're going to do this. And here you just need to explain exactly how it is that you're going to do it. Then you'll say whether or not it is met and have a contingency plan for what to do if it's not met. So if your data is not normal, 
the question here is going to be, you know, are you going to manipulate the data to make it normal? Or are you going to um, maybe do a different type of test? So maybe use a non-parametric test or something else, you know, to make up for this and still continue with the analysis. So here's where you'll describe that. And again, um, we have some kind of decision tree type of resources on our website to help you identify which test is best for your study. So here's an example of presenting the data from these assumptions tests. In this case, this person was examining normality. To do that, they looked at a PP plot. And you can see that their data is plotted pretty consistently along the line. So there, um, the results of this test are that there's no significant deviations, indicating that normality has been met. So that's kind of the green light, um, depending on what test they're doing, if it's robust or not. But yeah, this is telling us, yes, I can go forward. My assumptions met so I can move on with the analysis that I intended to do. Here is another example. In this case, we're not using, um, we're not presenting an actual table, but instead kind of presenting the figures of what was done. So in this case, they're looking at multicollinearity um, for these different variables. And they are explaining here that there's one residual, there's one observation that is exceeding the residual. Um, indicating that it's an outlier. So again, here we're kind of looking at that normality piece just in a different way. And the way that they handled this outlier is that they excluded it from the analysis. Um, this again is very individual. So that may be right for this person, but it may not be right for your study to exclude. So it kind of just depends on, you know, how many outliers there are. Um, or is it still a sample size that is appropriate for your study and kind of thinking through some of those pieces. So once you do all of that, you can finally get into the analysis um, for, your, for your actual research questions. So for this, you will want to do each of these bullets here for each of the research questions or hypotheses. So for each one, you should be, um, explaining any changes uh, from the originally proposed data analysis plan. So that may be rooted in your assumptions testing. If your assumptions were not met and you can't go forward with a particular test, here's where you may be saying, you know, my assumptions weren't met, so I went on to do um, this test instead. So you'll report those deviations. And then you're going to clearly identify the variables that you were using in your analysis. So independent variables, dependent variables, predictors, and also covariates. You want to clearly identify which ones you're using. And then you'll report the appropriate statistics that are associated with each test. Um, so this will vary based on the test that you're doing. Each test has a different specific test statistic. So for example, if you're doing a t-test, you should be reporting the t-statistic. If you're doing an ANOVA test, you should be reporting the f-statistic. And then you may have some other things to report like p-values, effect sizes, and confidence intervals, just depending on the type of test that you're doing. And again, um, there are some resources to that effect on our website. We also have a software that we um, offer to students called Intellectus that helps out with reporting this data as well. It kind of, you put your data into this, um, this software and you select the analysis that you want to do, and it provides you the uh, a table with these appropriate statistics. So it kind of gives you that already. Um, and then you'll report any post hoc testing if applicable. So, for example, if you did an ANOVA test and um, you find a significant difference between some of the levels, the next step may be to identify where is the significant difference. Um, so kind of just getting into the stats of it there, you'll, you'll just kind of have to know if a post hoc test is appropriate. Um, and if that's something that you're struggling with, you know, feel free to reach out. We can, we can always help with breaking down some of the statistics of it. And then the last step here will be to clearly state whether or not your hypothesis was, um, rejected or whether you 
failed to reject the hypothesis, uh, the null hypothesis. So this kind of package is what you want to replicate for each research question. And I will go through a few examples. So here's an example of an independent samples t-test. This test was done to determine the differences in uh, the score of this particular instrument based on gender. So we want to see if there's a difference between males and females with regard to um, the total score on this scale. Here, they're clearly identifying their independent variable and dependent. So our independent variable is gender. The dependent variable is um, the score on the instrument. And they're letting us know that the results of the t-test were not significant and reporting the relevant statistics in APA format. So we have our degrees of freedom here in the parentheses, the value of the t, the p-value, and then we also have some effect size over here. If you're unsure on um, how or what to present for your test, uh, for your analysis. Something I always do is I, I just Google um, APA format and then whatever test I'm doing. And that that's pretty straightforward way to see exactly what numbers you should be reporting from your output. Um, also, depending on the software that you're using there, they typically have a lot of handbooks like SAS, I know, and SPSS have a lot of handbooks on exactly which numbers to take from the output where they're showing you the output um, and kind of circling each number and explaining what it is. So if you're kind of stumbling there, uh, that may be a helpful way to get through that. And then they're providing the explanation of what this result means. Now, remember here, we're not interpreting it um, on a deep level. We're just kind of saying on the face, okay, yes, no, what do these numbers mean? So here, this indicates that there are no significant differences on the scale score based on gender. So we know that um, because of the p-value here. And then they're indicating that the null hypothesis was not rejected. So these are all of those pieces from the previous slide for this particular research question. Um, and then depending on your test, you'll report a few different things. So with the t-test, since we really want to understand the differences in the mean of these two groups, we're going to be presenting the mean and standard deviation. So you see here that these numbers are different, but based on um, the test, based on the level of significance, these are not significantly different. So just something to note as well, that even though they are different values, they aren't uh, different enough to rise to the level of significance. Here is another example. In this case, we are looking at an independent samples t-test. And we, again, wanna know if there is a difference in these scores, but this time based on school level. So again, we are identifying our independent and dependent variables. Independent variable in this case would be school level. So we pretty much just swapped out gender. And then the dependent variable is the score. In this case, we find that the results are indeed significant. We're reporting the relevant statistics here. You'll notice that the degrees of freedom is the same. So in this case, it was 105. And in the previous, it was 105 as well. That's because the sample is the same. Um, and here we are concluding that there are significant differences based on the school level. And then we're uh, displaying the relevant statistics. So we've got our mean, our standard deviation, and a definitive statement with regard to our null hypothesis. Here we're saying that the null hypothesis was rejected. In this example, the researcher conducted a one-way analysis of variance, so an ANOVA test. And here they wanted to understand um, if there were differences in the perception of teachers towards professional learning effectiveness. And in this case, they're using that same scale that we uh, looked at in the previous two t-tests um, and their um, independent here variable here is the years of teaching so we're looking at years of teaching as the independent variable and the scale is the dependent variable notice here that rather than reporting the t we're reporting the f so again depending on the test that you're doing the apa format is going to be different notice we also have two degrees of freedom as opposed to one which we had in the t-test so 
there's just a few differences in how you're going to be reporting the different tests. Um, in this case, we're concluding that there is no difference in the scores based on years of teaching experience. This is a pretty um, high p-value, 0.555. Um, so we're saying that the results are not significantly different. And because they are not significantly different, we are failing to reject our null hypothesis. Now, in this case, since this is an ANOVA test, you'll notice there's more than two groups here, whereas in the t-test, we pretty much just had two groups for each. So we're reporting each of the levels that were tested in the ANOVA and then the relevant statistics. So again, mean and standard deviation. Okay, in this example, the researcher did a Pearson's correlation. So they're trying to look at the relationship between these variables. The variables that they were examining are positive attributes attributes of self-compassion and perceived level of caring efficacy in nurses. Um, here, again, you'll notice that the way in which you report this is a little bit different. So now we're not reporting our F statistic or our T statistic. We're reporting um, the correlation coefficient R and the p-value. So they are providing the correlation coefficient and p-value for each variable, self-kindness, common humanity, mindfulness, um, and also the positive attribute subscale. Here, it looks like uh, they determined that they were positive, positively correlated with um, this caring efficacy. And because they were positively correlated, they concluded that those who were scoring higher in the positive attributes of self-compassion also were scoring higher in the perceived level of self caring of caring efficacy. So since we are seeing a correlation between these two variables, we can reject the null hypothesis, um, indicating that there was a significant finding here. And here's an example of how you might note that. So if you have a lot of variables in a table, it may be helpful to put stars for any variables where there is a significant finding to help the reader just like quickly understand what was significant here. Skipped one. Okay, and then this is an example of a regression. So um, if you're doing a linear regression or a logistic regression, um, or maybe a, a multivariate regression, you might uh, present something like this. So here, right up front, they're saying the results of this regression were significant. They're giving you all of the relevant statistics um, and explaining what that is. So in this case, they had a number of predictive variables. These are the predictors here in the table. And these were uh, predictors looking at the outcome prevention behaviors score. So maybe it was some type of scale that they used. Um, so they're listing out each of the predictors and they are providing the relevant statistics for those predictors. Um, and so you can see here the significance level of each of the different predictors. And you can see that sex is less than 0.05. It's quite small here. So we can determine that sex is a positive predictor of this um, particular outcome. Um, one thing to note too, so these tables that we're getting here, when you run your tests in the specific software that you're using, you're going to get these tables. Um, so. You, sometimes you may have to manipulate them a little bit, but pretty much uh, this information is going to be in those tables. And again, we do have that Intellectus software that does a really good job of, um, of giving these tables. And I believe we offer 30, a 30-day 30 trial. So if that's something that, that you're looking for, that may be helpful. So once you've gone through each of those steps and presented the findings and the relevant tables, then you're just going to go ahead and summarize the findings of your research study, um, ensuring that you're addressing each of the research questions and each of the hypotheses that you've already outlined, and just restate what those answers to the hypotheses are. So, um, you know, was there a significant finding? Was there not? Really just making sure you have some clear statements here. Um, and then you'll just transition into the discussion chapter. So 
you may say something like in the next chapter, the um, researcher will describe the implications of these results. Kind of just a brief transition to kind of move you along here. But that is the end of the content for this um, webinar. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. I'll open it up for Q&A now.